Welcome everybody, week 15, day two. And uh, your bit fields are grading right now. Uh, it looks like there is a mix of scores on this. It's pretty much bimodal. Some people got 100%, some people got zero. If you got some sevens, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to do a little review of like um, the different data structures we've done and like when I would use them and things like that. So let's say that I wanted, uh, let's say that I wanted to give you an assignment, which I was actually thinking about doing, and I might still do it, where you have to um, count the number of words in a file. Like how often does the word the appear? How often does the word a uh, appear? How would you guys do that? What data structure would you do for that? Let's say that I wanted to get the top yeah, let's just, yeah, let's just start off simple. Make a count. How many times each word appears in a file? Is the audio out for anyone else? Testing, testing. You can try uh, leaving Emma and coming back in. Speaking of mi music, is that a Gibson behind me? Uh, no, that is a uh, EC10. It's a cheap ass guitar, but it is recommended to me by um, a friend of mine who plays in a metal band. And it's actually not bad. Not bad. The, uh, the frets are a little sharp. They need to be filed down a little bit. But um, um, sounds, sounds decent to me, at least. So yeah, for a cheap guitar, like pretty solid. Um, a little bit of fret buzz. But, yeah. All right. Uh, BST. Anyone else? Any other? Any other uh, ideas? How would you? How would you go about doing it? I should do that. Then, and then for the little mini app, I have a. That one's actually pretty decent. I actually like that. It's a boss. Katana. Of one of these is the amp for it, and uh, yeah, sounds pretty good. Got some good features on it. Okay, uh, what was the question in Kearney? I want you to write a program that counts how many times a word appears in a file. How did you do that? Efficiently. A try? Mm. Have we gone over tries? I don't think we've gone over tries yet. We should probably talk about tries. All right, so Malia is giving the answer for the class. Uh, <laughs> all right, so yeah, let's do something like that. Let's say counter.cc. BST would work as well. It's not as efficient as a hashing method. All right, so we could we could do a struct of both a string and a count, um, but I think the map itself is good enough for this purpose. So we have an unordered map between a string and an int, technically an unordered int, but un, yeah, unsigned int. Uh, what does this call this counter? Okay, and then if we do things like this, we could say. Uh, um, it's too many letters. H. H. Apple. So how many times does the word Apple appear? G plus plus. Enter.cc. The answer is zero, because we haven't put anything in the hash table yet. Now, what if we set h apple equals 10? Then we get 10. But we set h apple plus plus. Then we get 1. What if we do this four times? 
we get four. Do you guys understand what's going on here? So this is a mapping between a string and an int. So for whatever string you put in there, there's an int associated with it, it defaults to zero. Uh, you have to be careful uh, when using square brackets in this way because um, it will create an entry in the hash table. Just like if you do this and you print out the value there, it, it'll actually insert Apple into the hash table and give it a value of zero and then look it up. And so usually we need to use count, right? So if h.count apple is not zero, then we'll print out, print out the value. Otherwise, else, so So whenever you square brackets with uh, a hash table, in general, you need to combine it with count. Because if you don't, it actually will insert it into the hash table and it'll fill up your hash table with things that you're searching for. You wouldn't think that search, search is not supposed to be uh, something that modifies the data structure, right? If you search for something in a binary search tree, it shouldn't add it to the binary search tree, but it does. And so this is square bracket is, um, used for both searching and for inserting. And so if you do a search without this if statement here, it'll both insert and search at the same time, which is not usually what people expect. But um, H apple is inserting an apple into the map, but what's the int attached to the pair? It is searching for an integer based on this key. So the key, a key is what you're searching on and a value is what we're looking for. So we are searching through a hash table to, uh, using a key of apple, and there is an integer associated with apple. And by default, it's zero. But if we do something like this, h apple equals 100,000, then every time we read through the hash table searching for apple, we will get 100,000. So, given this, do you guys think you could write a program search is giving you the int value for the pair? Yeah, uh, so an unordered map is a pair, <coughs> strings and ints, but in this case, you don't even have to think of it as a pair. If you use square brackets, you don't ever have to encounter the fact that the unordered map is actually, when you call find on, a, on an unordered map, it returns a pair and then you have to do dot first and dot second. If you use square brackets, you don't have to worry about that. That's one of the nice things about square brackets. Okay. So it is a mapping between strings and ints. And um, every time you insert apple, the int gets incremented automatically. No, no, no. Right. So there is just a number associated with this string. And so in this line, we are associating the number 100,000 with the string apple. In this case, we're associating zero with it. It doesn't increment it. Um, I mean, unless you're like a couple minutes behind on the stream. <coughs> if I did this, then yeah, every time I do an increment operator, it's gonna increase the value associated with it by one. So we get 100,000 and, 100, and five. So given this, do you think you could write a program that would count how many times each word appears in a file? It adds one to the int value in the pair. That is correct. It adds one to the integer associated with Apple. All right, Mui, I know you can do it, but uh, for the class, could you write a program that counts how many times each word appears in a file?
Do you remember how to read from a file? Good. F stream. Alright, so we will make a we'll open up a file. We're gonna make an input file stream. Input file stream named ends is just my go-to and um what file should be open? Let's ask the user. Read. Please enter a file. And yes, that is embedded inside of the constructor for the file because the read library is freaking awesome. You can do that. So um, yeah, that'll that'll prompt the user for file name. They'll type it in. It'll open up that file, and we will have a variable called ends. So if we wanted to just print all of the words and ends, we could say while ends um, see out read from ends. Read a string from ends, followed by space. Let's say, eh, the line's fine. And uh, yeah, okay. So g plus plus counter dot cc exploded. Uh, let's see. Is there a file name? Counter.cc. And so I just wrote cat essentially. <laughs> right? Please enter a file name. So it's printing out every single word in that file that I just made. One day I hope to do something I'm most proud of as Kearney as is proud of his read. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things where like IO streams has been kind of garbage since they were made. And they're just like awkward and they were kind of a tech demo like the whole bit shift thing was just kind of to demonstrate that you could overload an operator in c plus plus that's really what it was there to teach people is that you can overload operators and it, it doesn't make any sense like you, you you can't do this using io streams normally and it was just like like if you if i find myself writing the same kinds of functions over and over again like to handle error and clear errors and things like that which is really awkward and i had to keep teaching students how to do it over and over again Eventually, I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to put this into a function and save it. Yeah. So that is, yeah. And so I guess we don't need the curly braces if we don't want. So that's two lines of code that will open up a file and print all of the words in it to the screen. Um, if we wanted to actually cat the file, we could do this. And there's a there's the file. So two lines of code to do cat. Cat preserves spaces, of course. Alright, so is C ever gonna update their IO? I don't know. I, I proposed this for standardization and not a single person responded to it, so you know. Doubtful, I guess. I don't know. Maybe someday. Twenty twenty six, here we come. Okay, so here's a hash table. Okay. While ends, um, um, this is reading one string at a time, so all we have to do is. table see out the first part followed by the second part okay 
Okay, so uh, the word hashtag include appears five times in the file. Um, everything else is unique, maybe. Okay. So there you go. Four lines of code, and it will count how many times each word appears in a file. A lot of things nested within each other. I'd, if I was writing this, you know, for students, I would probably not nest everything inside of each other, but yeah, there you go. You want to see it on Hamlet? So Ophelia appears 59 times. Though appears 16 times. Polonius with a comma five times. And again, if you're doing this for real, you'd probably do things like deleting you know, punctuation marks and things like that. Uh, uppercaseify everything so that, um, you know, capital letters at the beginning of a sentence don't change the word count. Uh, get rid of anything that's not a letter, probably. Clowns appears one time. Revenge, only twice, not bad. King, 118 times in all caps. Could you sort the output by how much things occur? Yeah, so that's a good question. So how do we sort it by the value? And the answer is, uh, we can't really, we can't really. Um, so we could, um, Do a, could you use a map instead of an unordered map? We could, but, it'd but have to go backwards. Then the key, the key and the value, because right now we're using the string to do the indexing, and yeah, you would want to be using then the value to to do the indexing. So, um, a couple different ways we could do that. Um, we just make a binary search tree, I guess. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, just do a binary tree insertion sort, just insert, sure. just grab each pair in the unordered map and just insert it. Sure, let's do this. <laughs> oh, that, that works too. <laughs> All right, so for every app, uh, A faster way of doing this. I think I think I would just use a set and then use define a operator uh, greater than. We could. Or we could. I, less than. I think I think this will work. Um, let me let me see if I can get this to work. All right. So we are going to insert into the binary search tree m dot insert. Um, M P dot second. So we're going to map between the int, an int and a string now. And so we're going to save the the int as the thing we're searching for. Is that going to work? No, because that's going to that's going to eliminate duplicates. Um, Do a multi map, and then we can have duplicates. In doesn't like that. Uh, right, m dot insert. Then save. So that works. And so we're gonna. We're going to sort it based on the count, and then we're we're going to print it using the count as the key to look up, which you normally don't want to do because the count changes over time and stuff like that. But in this case, what it's going to have the effect of doing is sorting the tree from least to greatest by the count. And when we print it out, then the, the strings associated with it will come out in sorted order. Um, 
we might want to alphabetize after that point, but I don't, I don't really care. Okay, so then for auto p in every pair in map, see out p dot second. That's the string followed by p dot first. That is the count. Of course it worked. First time, uh, every time. Boom. So you cannot sort an unordered map, unfortunately, uh, Bazookian. It is an unordered map. Unordered maps cannot be sorted. So you could copy all the elements out of it and then sort the elements that came out of it, but that's what I did with the binary search tree. The binary search tree is the, um, yeah, it sorts things. So, um, yeah, so there you go, Emma. Good question. So we have now a list of the top words in Hamlet. And uh, Hamlet is pretty popular. The and of I. So maybe, maybe we could uh, throw away words. Let's clean it up a little bit. Let's see. Let's make it a little more professional. So uh, rather than doing this on one line, do you guys understand what's happening here? So right, right now what it's doing is it's reading a word from the file. It's reading a word from the file and then it's jumping to that spot in the hash table. So it's jumping to the spot for Apple or whatever and it's incrementing the count. So every time a word appears, Hamlet appears, it jumps to the spawn the hash table for Hamlet and updates the count by one. And so it's it's associating an integer with a string and the integer is how many times that word appears. But now we want to split this apart. And just say string s is equal to read from the file. So we're gonna read a word if s dot size is less than four. So we're gonna get rid of I's and A's and things like that. Um, continue. So we'll get rid of small words. And then we'll insert it. And increment the count by one. So you should probably check for size after stripping punctuation. Well I, I haven't stripped punctuation yet. So Yeah but I'm saying oh okay so you're gonna do it. Yeah. I'm just I'm starting off by just filtering filtering on size. But yeah, yeah, I, I got you. I got you. It'll uh, it'll be up next. Uh, text. And so there we go. So now we got bigger words, uh, more interesting words. Let's say Polonius and Shall and Claudius and Horatio. And... Yeah, but we got some we got some punctuation in here. Yeah, we got some punctuation in here. So. The all caps tell us who has the most lines in the play, technically. So True. Hamlet has the most lines, then Horatio. We, all, we also should probably all uppercase it, just so that, you know, if there's a word that begins a sentence and it has a capital yeah. letter, then, um, yeah, then it'll... So right now we got Hamlet's at 3d8. So let's uppercaseify the entire thing. And so, uh, do you guys know how to uppercaseify a string? S inserts and plus plus increments. So S, uh, yeah, this this doesn't insert anything. I mean, it'll, it'll technically insert if it doesn't exist, but you could, for example, if you do C out H S, that would just do a search, okay? So this is a reference uh, to the count of how many times that word has appeared. So you just print it if you want, but here um, it is updating the count by one. So every time, every time Hamlet appears, it updates the count associated with Hamlet. Two upper, s dot two upper, does not exist. It's not pipeline, unfortunately. It, pro it probably should exist. <laughs> Let's be real here. It probably should exist. So, how do we, how do we uppercase by a string? 
Well, we can write a function, right? Void uppercase of phi, taking in a string by reference. And we can say for every for every character in that string, c is equal to two upper that character. So that's one way of doing it. Um, there's a more STL version of it. So there you go, everything's... So there's more Hamlets now, right? Okay. We still need to get rid of Sir but we need to get rid of these things. Yeah, Python Python has a two upper. I don't know why string to, uh, uh, the string class in C++ doesn't. Uh, so another way we could do this is calling transform from s.begin begin to s.end. Uh, something I think. You can have just a colon colon just on its own on go. Uh transfer uh transform, thank you. Um yeah the two upper is a weird thing. And um a lot of times it's implemented as a macro and you can't pass macros to functions. And so um oh right you have to give the place to put it back in. That's right. Yeah, so stood to upper, yeah, I forgot that one. Yeah. S begin, S end, S don't begin. Yes, yeah, so that means the two upper in the global scope, which in this case is stood. And that way it doesn't, it doesn't do the um, public. Um, what, uh, yeah, so. This is this is the official C way of doing it. Uh, if you want, you could go std to upper if you wanted. I think. Nope. Doesn't like it. No matching function call. Uh, yeah, because it's in the global scope. Actually, it's on this std scope. Ah, that's how you do it. Okay. And so you guys are in C side forty one now. That's the. That's the official way to uppercaseify a string in C++. Um, I wish they would just bake that into language myself. Um, all right. Uh, you could just strip punctuation that's at the beginning and end. True. True. Because Har Harrison was uh, mentioning that uh, when you're if you strip all punctuation, then I'll and ill will be the same word. True. So to combat that, you could kind of just go for punctuation that's either at the beginning or at the end. Hmm. Okay. So let's do that. So for every character in the original string, You want to keep well, let's, let's just do this at first. Um, if um, is alpha c s dot push back c. So we'll just copy over the um, the letters into it. That's before we uppercase it. There you go. So. Hamlet, that lord, this with your king, Palatio, Horatio, Polonius, Laertes, Gertrude, Ophelia, Rosencrans, Marcellus. Yeah. 
Yeah, it'll, it'll just be ill, right? So now... Uh, um, you can write a loop that would pop things off if they're at the end while... While the last character is not, whatever, I don't care. You can do something like this, right? Like while s dot back, um, while not is alpha s dot back, s dot pop back. You do, you do something like that. But um, honestly, I'm fine. I'm fine with this. Transform. How does that work for you guys? Hate to be annoying, but for optimization purposes, you want the uh, size chip, at, uh, the size check, to be before the transform. get an alpine message um, interesting uh, just talking after class just continue break out of the loop now continue we'll jump back up to the top but if there's nothing left to read then um, it will die in fact we can put a thing in here if not in this book. So if you try reading from file, there's nothing left, then uh, ends becomes invalid at this point. So we should not do anything with this. Although I think the read, I'm confused how the transform line with the colon colon to upper. So that means um, the two upper in the global scope. You see that? It won't work without it because um, to, like I said, it's, it's just a weird thing that has to do with how uh, C++ is inherited um, things from SeaWorld. And to upper, I believe, by default is written as a macro. A macro is a thing that looks like this. Define to lower C. Um, um, C minus equals... If C is so, A is capital A sixty five. C 
seven. So uh, that's, that's a macro, and it looks like a function, it behaves like a function, but it's not a function. And so you can't pass it to, you can't pass it as a function pointer to, to a, a thing. And so there's actually a version of two upper that's a macro, and there's a version that's a function, and this is picking the two upper that is a function. Because otherwise it's gonna try passing the macro to it, you can't pass a macro, a macro doesn't even exist. And so it'll, it'll just explode. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so this just means global scope. Uh, but it, it's just a weird oddity. That you normally don't have to do this. Like if you're doing like, I don't know, like a square root or something, like maybe, huh? Did not take a char. Uh, no member name square in the global namespace. No, I didn't include CMAP. No, oh, whatever. The point is, is that you only need to do this usually with um, Two upper and two lower, the the CC type stuff. Uh, it, it's it's weird how they're implemented, and so it's just a it's just a weird a weird feature. And if if you don't understand this, then just write an uppercase of five function. Okay. Is it safer to always use colon colon? No, just see if it works or not. It, I I wouldn't do this normally. It, I only do this because if I take it out, All right? Let's see here. Uh, let's see if that makes a difference. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Works. Okay. It's it's just an oddity due to how that header file is implemented. Uh, it has been graded. C plus plus is so quirky. Eh, I mean, usually not. Like this is um, there there is some weirdness just from the fact that it's inheriting from a fifty year old language called C. Um, but. It's, it's like, you can see just how clean this is. And if, if you didn't have this, if you didn't have this, like all of these would explode into much longer and longer um, things. Like writing this, this program took me like, I don't know, like a minute, you know? And if I had to do this in C, like, oh man, like C, working with strings in C and like, You'd have to make your own data structure because they don't have any data structures in the standard library in C. So I would need to make a, my own hash table and um, I would have to make sure I don't leak memory and don't, and, I, and I'm allocating and deallocating properly because there's none of that. Every string is has to be nude essentially or mallocked. I mean, you, you, it would turn into a project instead of just something I could just kind of like, here you go. We're counting the words, you know. Um, yeah, and so yeah, so something like this, it's just a, it, it's actually a weird exception. Like, it, there's very few cases where you're going to encounter like actual weirdness like that, and and it's because of how CC type is implemented. Okay, it's CC type. Undefined, <laughs> so this is getting rid of the macros. So, yeah. and so it's using these instead. So, yeah, two upper, right?
useful, is it? <laughs> So this is a bit field. You guys see this? Shift a bit, right? So if you pass in zero, it's gonna be one, right? Because it's one left shifted zero times. If you pass in one, it left shifts it once and it's two. This is how you do enums. Look, I told you guys, bit fields, like they're, they're a thing. And so they have a macro that will generate 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, rather than having it hard-coded. Okay. Um, and you will see bit shifty stuff, you know. Yeah, so is upper, right? Is def It's a macro. You see that? Two upper is a macro. So it's not actually a function, um, or it might not be, I don't know. And so the compiler, so basically by doing the colon colon, it's picking the, the global namespace function rather than the macro. Is there a way to undeclare a variable like you can undefine a def? No, uh, you have to you have to wrap it in a scope. Variables live until their scope ends. And so if you want to uh, terminate a variable early, you have to wrap it, even in just an anonymous scope. Right, so then main.cc, that's then counter.cc. Right, so if I, if I wanted to get rid of a ridge, I could do Like if I don't want a ridge sitting around while I'm doing the rest of the stuff with S, then um, when we hit the close um, curly brace right here, uh, a ridge will get deallocated at that point. So we don't have two copies of, of it floating around. Okay. How does the computer understand programming languages? <laughs> <laughs> oh man I'm getting NAM flashbacks right now um, the, uh, the answer is um, compi making compiler is probably one of the most complicated things that computer scientists have ever done and um, making compiler you, you will probably have to do it depending on what institution you go to in your junior year. And when I took it, it was actually two classes because to make a compiler was two classes. The first class, you made half of it. And the second class, you made the other half of it. And you had one product that you built up over two entire classes. And at the end of the day, you could punch in, um, you could punch in um, a program and a programming language you make, and it spits out an executable. And you could run it, and it's a cool feeling. But it is um, it is a, a, a very, very long question to answer. The um, CSI 45 class, we go into what the compiler actually does, all the different steps that go into it, and stuff like that. Uh, real short, first step is uh, the preprocessor. Anything that starts with a hashtag is the preprocessor. It actually runs prior to the compiler and it does textual manipulation. So for example, if I wanted to change all of my unordered maps to unordered sets, I could say define unordered map to be unordered set. And now it would change this to be an unordered set, which it won't work anymore. Um, Cause I haven't included it, but it doesn't matter. So you can, so this define here is doing a, a, a textual search and replace on my file down below. It is searching for every instance of unordered map and, and textually replacing it with unordered set. So you're looking at this and it looks like I wrote unordered map. Nope. I wrote unordered set. It says no template named unordered set. See, the compiler is seeing unordered set because the preprocessor runs prior to it. The, the, the compiler doesn't see 
um, any hashtag, any things except for pragmas. And so um, we talked about this earlier, right? Hashtag pragma once. Uh, you, you typically put this into a header file, right? Pragmas get passed on to the compiler. None of the other preprocessor directives do. And you put pragma once at the top of your header files. Um, was the programming have five levels and what we're doing level three, four stuff? Um, so right now you're in freshman level computer science. Next year you'll be in sophomore level. You'll take with me, hopefully. Uh, I guess some of you guys are transferring, which is kind of sad, but it's okay. Um, discrete math and assembly. And then after that you're a junior and then you take compilers. And so uh, if, you, if you thought that like you could just kind of keep your head down and not learn about data structures, you, you will crash and burn. You will crash and burn when you get to having to make a compiler because the compiler involves a lot of data structures. You've got to have a list of every single symbol that you've ever seen. Like if, you know, when the person says int, um, you know, con is great equals zero. And then down below I say con is great plus plus then uh, the compiler has to know that it's seen a variable named con is great before. So there is a data structure. You have to have a data structure. You have to keep track of lots of data. It's a data structure. So you have to have a data structure that tracks all of the different variables that you've seen and have been declared. And if I do something like this and put it above, that's a compiler error, right? And so you have to keep track of who's been declared and what their type is. And like if I said con is great, is equal to high, you know, won't compile. Why? Because that's a string. Con is greater than it. So you have to implement a type system. You have to have a, a system of converting between ints and floats and doubles and strings. Nope, can't do strings. But chars, yeah, sure. Um, and so that's why I'm trying to teach you guys all of these data structures because this is the level that computer science people operate at, right? And so if I was trying to keep track of all the different variables I've seen, I'd make probably an order map with the name of the variable being the key and then the value being some sort of class that I made that holds all the information on that on that variable. What's its name? What's its type? What value does it hold? And maybe other information like what register I'm going to put it in or um, there, there's some other fiddly details that don't matter, but you would track all of the, you have like a, just a list of all the different variables that exist. and. When something goes out of scope, then, and you try using a ridge down here, see out a ridge, then the compiler needs to be like, nope, nope, that doesn't exist anymore. You know, it needs to be deleted out of the data structure. So this inserts a variable named orig into the data structure, tracking all the variables you've seen. Boom, goodbye, doesn't exist anymore, compiler error. And so you've, you're gonna have a ton of different data structures that support your coding. And so you have to become very fluent with data structures. How do you add things to it? How do you search things in it, change things in it, and delete things from it? Those are the four basic things, right? So here, a uh, string is a data structure. It's a data structure of characters. So this is getting the size of the data structure. Uh, this is saying for every element in the data structure, do something. This is saying for every element in the data structure, call that function on it. This is doing a search and a, well, it's doing a change. It's reading a value and then modifying it. And so that's, you have to de develop this level of fluency with data structures because when you do that, like, like nobody answered, like I could count how many words there were in Hamlet and you could see it was four lines of code, <laughs> right? When you, when you know data structures, right? And that, and, and I'm not like crapping on you guys. It's just like, I'm, I'm trying to motivate you, like, when you understand these things, like, you can just write, like, this code would be super annoying. Like I said, if I had to do this in C, this would be a really, really annoying program to write. It'd be a really annoying program to write. And I would, I would be able to write it. I'm not confident that it'd work right the first time because I might leak memory, might forget to delete something that should have been deleted. Because all these strings, there's no string class in C. There's no string class in C. You gotta make, you gotta, you gotta allocate, you gotta call new or malloc is the C version of it. And you gotta remember to free it. You know, every string, every 
copy every new string, all of these things, every entry in the data, all those have to be nude and deleted correctly. So, you know, when, when you finish with CSI 41, uh, it's like the expanding brain meme, right? Like you, you stop having to worry about like mundane details, you know, like making a hash table, you just, you just make it and then you can just update the count like that. Right. So, um, yeah. So to finish your, your question after the preprocessor runs, that's step one, then the compiler, uh, identifies all the individual tokens inside of the like a parentheses and things like that. And it, and it tokenizes the, the input. So it goes from having double quotes and parentheses to like token parentheses recognized. And then, um, then it runs through something called a parser. The parser sees if this is a grammatically correct sentence and there is no exhaustive list of possible sentences, right? Like I could say X is equal to one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one, right? You can't just pattern match, right? You have to, uh, you have to say int, you know, type variable name equals expression. And what is an expression? An expression can be X plus Y, it could be X minus Y, X plus Y. And so these things are recursively defined because the X itself is an expression and that could be X plus X or X minus Y or whatever. And so all, there's this big recursive definition for the entire language. And if you do anything that makes it ambiguous, then the parser won't parse and your code won't compile and you, you won't have a compiler at all really is, is the matter. So yeah, that's why I was kind of laughing. It's, it, I'm not laughing at you. It, it was more like a laughter of horror and misery from having to write the compiler <laughs> myself. It worked, you know, and it's a good feeling when you get it done. But man, that was a massive project. And if you have a bug in your code on week one, you're gonna have a bug on your code on week 20 because it doesn't go away. You know, so you gotta have a very solid foundation from CSI 40. You gotta have a solid foundation from 41. And after that, then it's just hard work. Yep. So, so it's not often when you're making your own data structure functions. Mm, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, usually when I make my own data structure, it is going to be either something that's not in the standard library, like a try, um, or it'll be a composite of multiple data structures. For example, when I made that hash table the other day with chaining, it was a vector of binary search trees. Does that make sense? So do you understand that, Emma? Like. Um, a lot of times you'll, you'll composite multiple, like I'll make a linked list of, um, strings, <laughs> right? That's a data structure inside of a data structure. Strings, a vector. And so it's, and so we will typically build, take these basic building blocks of data structures and combine them together into bigger data structures. And that you absolutely do need to know. So, um, your, your next homework assignment will. Uh, how are you doing that? So, um, yeah, uh, well, not your next one. Your next one's going to be really easy. Okay. So your next homework assignment is going to be doing this. I've already pretty much given you the answer to it. Uh, there's, uh, an even easier way actually than this for the, for the next homework assignment. What data structures or cryptocurrencies normally build with? They're kind of like linked lists, I guess, because you have a blockchain and each thing verifies the previous thing. Kind of like linked lists, you can think of them that way. All right. Um, yeah. So for your for your next assignment, you're gonna count, I think the number of letters in a file, similar. Okay. Okay, uh, any other questions about this? What, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this, by the way? Before we got it all complicated, it was just like that big. <clears throat> what are, what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel do you feel confident like? Oh, I, now that I see it, I can I could probably do it, or no clue what's going on here. Golden Retriever using computer.
I'd be stuck getting two upper to work for two hours probably. Yeah, well, well at least you should know like how to write the uppercase of five function, right? Like like that thing that we were we had up there. <clears throat> that's a that's a bit of weirdness. And uh, you, you, it's okay if you be puzzled by it. Where does H get filled? Right here. So the the first time you do a search in um, this hash table, it inserts zero for you. So like I said, if you if you try doing something like this, like see out Apple. then you will see that Apple actually got inserted. <laughs> Apple actually got inserted into the hash table. <clears throat> so score brackets is not recommended by, in most circumstances. In this case, it's actually fine because the first time we read, you know, Hamlet or whatever, it'll initialize to zero and then increment to one. So it's fine. It actually, we're not gonna get any stray zeros in, in the code at all, right? If I take that out, see how there's no, there's no stray zeros anywhere in the code. So, um, in this case, it's fine. Usually, though, like I said, um, you want to say if h dot count apple. Yeah, so you want to see if it exists before using square brackets because if you use square brackets with hash table, it will insert into it even if you thought you're just searching. And so the the square bracket. Uh, is both used for insertion and for searching at the same time. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so it's um, uh, it's something you want to be cautious with. In this case, it's fine. But uh, if you want to be careful, then use uh, find and insert and delete. Uh, to capitalize the char, all I did was room is equal to two upper room. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Because uh, because if it's a macro, it works fine. You know? If you said like uh, char c is equal to two upper c, that's fine. Right. That'll even compile, by the way. What? You guys see what the problem with this is? But it compiles. It actually compiles. This is valid C++. So it's creating a variable named C, and it's setting its value equal to the uppercase version of the value that it has. <laughs> well, what value does it have? <laughs> Warning, it may be used uninitialized. I know. <laughs> so it's zero. But it doesn't have to be. It is uninitialized there. So it's setting its its value to be the uppercase version of something. Technically valid C++ though. Probably shouldn't be. Uh, that's why I said anytime you see a warning, you should treat it like it's pretty damn serious. Because this is actually a very subtle bug. Uh, it's using itself to initialize itself. It's using the stones to initialize the stones. Yeah. Frisbee, I'm not connected to a voice channel. Cool. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, two upper in this case is fine. You don't have to, you don't have to... Like I said, most of the time, like you're not gonna. What the hell's going on here? Um, you're not gonna need to do that, right? It, because it's a macro, or maybe it's a macro. I don't know. Who knows? But in the case of transform, you do have to do that, and that's just due to the the legacy code kinds of things. Yeah, the, it'll normally work fine. Rhythm is the music. Okay. So, any other comments about this?
Yeah, there, there's some there's some weird things in C plus plus like that. But pay attention to the warnings. <laughs> uh, it's like uh, enter array one hundred. We will initialize everything to be zero. See out element four from the array. Don't write code like this. I will be, I will be angry and upset if you write code like that. Yeah, of course it works. It's because, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say of course it works, um, but yeah, it does work. And and the reason for that is because um, an array is just a pointer, and four is uh, so a, a pointer is an integer. Four is an integer. And so whenever you do an array, what what's actually happening uh, is that and that and dereference the pointer pointed to by array plus four, which is the same thing as four plus array. When you actually write square brackets like that, it actually rewrites it like this. And so square brackets are just syntactic sugar around pointer math. And uh, if you go to like school at Berkeley, they actually do array axes like this. I've seen in some of their professor's code and I'm like, okay. So uh, that's the, an array is a pointer, that's an int, and then that's going to be, move four, four elements to the right of the pointer, and then it dereferences it. Hopefully you don't hate C++ after this, but that's also a legacy of C. So you can see it prints out 420. All four of those cases. So all, all four of these lines are actually exactly the same thing. <laughs> Don't do it though. Don't do it. It's a yeah. That that isn't very poggers. Yeah. Yeah, but that but that's that's why it works is because it, it actually just replaces. Um, the square bracket notation with just um, that. And you can add, you know, addition is associative and commutative and transitive. And um, yeah, so it works fine. It, it doesn't work if you do that with a vector, though, right? Like, so if, if you made a vector, vector events named vec of size 100, and we set vec square bracket 4 to be 420. Uh, the reason why this works, this is a class, right? Vector is a class, and it's got a square bracket operator overload. It does not work if you do this for square bracket vec. That does not work because there is no square bracket overload that takes an int on the left side and a vector on the right side. You could probably write one, which would be really funny. That maybe. Uh, maybe I guess you can. Yeah. No. Right. It'd be really funny though. Okay. So yeah, you can't you can't you can't do that that way. And that's one of the reasons why you shouldn't do this garbage unless you really uh, are looking for job security and you want to write code that nobody understands. Um, <laughs> don't do it that way because you. If you ever swap out your array for a vector, which you should in a lot of cases, uh, you can't, it, it, it won't work in that case. Okay. Vectors are not just pointers and stuff. Okay, so uh, Thomas has never seen such PS before. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. 
All right, so what else can we do with the standard library? Let me, uh, Level BS. Um, I'll put this up. Copy counter. CC. So what other things can we do with the standard library? Um, binary search trees, always sort things. So we, you, you saw right there, like you just put data into a binary search tree and Sorted, that was really nice. You can't sort a hash table. Um, well, you have any ideas for examples? Like, I, I, I'm really kind of a practical guy because like a lot of my, um, like I, I literally had a homework, homework a work assignment where they're like, uh, we need you to make a web app that does attendance tracking. And so they had text files of all the names of the people that attended a conference and they wanted to paste it into just a giant text field on a website and just have it count the names uh, across time, right? And so uh, the program would run when they click submit and then it would go away. And so I needed to have a persistent store that tracked names. And so I used uh, SQL as a backend, but um, it, it basically counted how many times each name appeared and it was that code, right? Basically. And, and I got paid cash money for it. You know what I mean? Like, it's like not hard, <laughs> you know, like a lot of, a lot of business tasks aren't technically very demanding. Like they're just, they can't figure out how to do it. And if you're a computer science person, you're like a wizard in the Harry Potter world. You can do things that other people can't do. It's so like, you know, and I spit it out in, you know, that much time. It, it took a little bit longer because I set up a SQL database and I was storing the data in it and um, pulled the data out of it and updated the counts and that kind of stuff. And then I also added functionality that if they typed in a name, a name wrong, then they could go in and delete that name and update the count on another name. So I gave them the ability to edit the, the counts themselves and add and delete participants and things like that. So I, I kind of, you know, spiced it up a little bit, but... It was no more than, you know, a day's work, probably a half day's work, you know, and I would go to the pool and read, you know, I think it was about $5,000 for four hours of work, something like that. It's not bad. It's not bad, babe. All right. Um, so, uh, Muya, you have an idea? Uh, just using an unordered map for counting stuff or... No, no, I, I, I want to show other uses of data structures in general, like kind of summarizing this entire. You could, uh, you could show how it could be used to do the last assignment. Bitfield? Uh, yeah, because with Bitfield, the uh, unordered maps can be used for mapping the strings to the, to the integer values. I kind of showed that last time though, right? Like, um, in the Pokemon assignment. Oh, like uh, yeah, with the map. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. So um, you, you can have the names of the weapons in there and, and just have them associated with the powers of two. Just data structures in general? Yeah. Um, Pretty broad question. And I know it's hard to it's hard to think of things when you're just like, yeah, the entire class. <laughs> yeah, like everything yeah. would be a good example of where to use data structures. Yeah. Maybe a text editor using linked yeah. lists or something like that. Interesting. Like, uh, when you say data structures, you mean like STL type data structures or like classes in general? Like for, for creating abstraction? I would, I would say like right now, like just the container classes. List. Oh, just containers. Okay. Yeah, um, list, stack queue. Uh, you could show how a stack could be used for parsing uh, parentheses. That'd be cool. Oh, yeah. 
That was the thing that I was showing you the other day, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was interesting. Hmm. Okay. Oh. Actually, I've already done this. I forgot about RPM calculator. That was a cool. Yeah, we didn't do that in this, cool this class. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so for this assignment, um, uh, let's see, four, five plus out. I put nine. So nine is on the stack right now. I'll put 10 on the stack on top of it. Say multiply, when you multiply, it pops two things off the stack and puts, pushes the results back on the stack. 90, uh, 10 minus 80. And then I could go 80, 80 plus, plus. So 80 was on the stack, push 80 on the stack, push 80 on the stack, plus. Takes the two things off the stack, puts 160 back on the stack. Plus takes the two off the stack, puts 240 back on the stack, and I print the result, it's 240. This is called reverse Polish notation for doing calculations. You don't need parentheses that way. Um, and that just involves pushing things onto the stack and popping things off the stack. Um, one of the more interesting uses of uh, stacks. How about, how about something that uh, um, Orny showed us? Um, so we've got 13 minutes left. Yeah, we can do this. So suppose I can actually just give the homework assignment right now and probably do it in 13 minutes. Okay, so imagine you've got a vimgold.cc. So imagine you've got an array, um, int um, array of size, size by size. Initialize it to zero. We don't have to. It's a global. Globals are initialized to zero by default. Did you guys know that also? Size t size equals ten. So what the uh, enter arrays? What do you not like about you? Uh, yep. If I say int uh, Bob, see yeah, Bob. Zero, no warning, right? Whereas if I made uh, int, int Sydney, see how Sydney, Sydney's uninitialized. Bob is not. Bob is guaranteed to be initialized to zero. doesn't come up too much because um, the use of globals is sort of deprecated. It's in general not considered a good idea, but there you go. So this is an array that is uh, that and um, okay. Um, let's make it a little smaller maybe. Okay, so I've made a uh, five by five um, array. 
and there is treasure on the board. And so the player is going to start at the top left corner and has to walk to the bottom right corner. You can only step south or east. So the question is, which route will give you the most points? And so this is a uh, apparently a senior level um, assignment at Monterey Bay, CSU MB. Uh, do you guys understand the assignment? Like, output the route that um, output the route that would yield the most points. Okay. Did you get it from Bell? Uh, no, from uh, 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 Nate Nate Beal. You gonna use Prim's algorithm? No, you don't need to. You could you could turn this into a graph problem and solve it. But there's actually there's actually a very uh, nice way of of doing this. And so what you can do is write down and the max value at every point, size by size, just zero. And you can also write down the direction you came from. Int. North, south, east. Actually, the only possibilities are north and west, right? So you can only come from the north or the west or, I guess, the starting location, right? It's got no parent. Okay, so uh, direction. Okay, so what we can do is we can say for every point in the in the array, um, we need to figure out whether we should come from the north or come from the west. Do you, do you guys understand the problem, first of all? Like, you, you have to start here. So you pick up one gold coin, and then you have to choose, do I walk east or do I walk south? You might be like, oh, well, walk south, it's got more money. Yeah, but what if there's like a trillion dollars over here? Then uh, if you walk south, you would never be able to get it because it is, uh, you can only walk south or you can walk east, that's it. Okay, and so, um, dollars, right? First of all, do you guys understand the problem? It's like a maze thing, kind of, but it's, um, so a, a naive solution would be to try every combination of directions. West, you know, east, 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 south, 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 east, 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 south, south, east, 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 you know, and so for every, for every, uh, you know, size, essentially, there is two options, south or east, and so it's an order two to the end problem, right? So uh, brute force would be order two to the uh, size, like the length of one dimension, because there's essentially five choices you have to make. Do I go east? Do I go south? Do I go east? Do I go south? And you're, you're going to make five, because <laughs> no matter which way you go, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. And then the others are fixed for you, right? After you've hit the bottom, you just have to go to the right. So, yeah, so it's a two to the n problem, right? Uh, that's bad, that's that's really bad. We can actually do this in order, we can do it in order, um, order size time. Size is five, so. Uh, 25, yeah, so. yeah. So essentially, it's it's essentially order in because the, the array has 25 things at it. You gotta process 25 things anyway. So essentially we can solve this for free because if you're gonna be reading this from a file, you've gotta process all 25 elements and you can actually solve it while you're actually inputting the, the data. Um, so in terms of big O, it's basically free. Okay, so what do we, how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, okay. So we're gonna start off by saying, um, okay, for int i equals zero, st i equals zero, i is less than five, i plus plus, do a doubly nested for loop.
Okay, so we're going to go from 0 to 4, 0 to 4. Do you guys understand this? Doubly nested 4 loop for a 2D array. Kind of kind of standard practice. You guys have seen this before? Like Anytime you have a, a 2D shape, you typically have a doubly nested 4 loop. Iterate over it. Having battle sleep flashbacks, it's fair. Okay, and so... Um, We should start off like this. So if i is equal to 0 and j is equal to 0, then um, we, need, we need to sort of initialize the starting point, right? So I guess we could do outside of the loop, but yeah, either way. Um, max 0, 0, equal to 1. So we pick up there, pick the coin. Put zero zero not so uh, we start off with whatever money's on the on the spot, uh, but more importantly the direction um, at zero zero is equal to start. So that's how we know we're like because uh, we're going to be backtracking to get to the uh, starting location. So that will tell us when we've hit the hit the start, um, and then after that we just continue. All right. Okay, so um, so when we are going, if we're on the top row, how many options do we have? Like if we're if we if we're processing this spot, how many ways do we have of getting to that spot? How many possible uh, neighbors could we come from the north? Could we come from the west? Because normally there's only two possibilities for each square on the map. There's only two ways we could have gotten there, approximately, right? We either have come from the north or we could have come from the west. How many ways could we have gotten there? One, not three. You can't come from the south, can't come from the east. The only way we could get here is from this square. So if we're on the top row or if we're on the left edge, we have to special case those. So uh, if... Uh, I should call these row and column, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, either way. So if i is 0, so if we are on the top row, then um, it's pretty easy. The total amount of money that we've picked up is going to be equal to the total amount of money from the person to, to the left. Like, let's say, um, let's make this a little more interesting. Three and six. So if we come to this point here, the total amount of money we've picked up is equal to 10. One, then we hit travel to the right. Four, travel to the right, 10. All right. So the amount of money we've picked up here is equal to um, the amount of money that we found to the left plus the amount of money uh, You guys see that? So the max array is holding the total amount of money we have found. The maximum amount of money we can find by the time we've gone to this point here. It's like for this one, it'll have the maximal amount of money from all the different possible routes. Going down this way, going that way, zigzagging. Anyway, at, at max, three across and three down, this guy right here, it'll hold, uh, what would be the max? Um, probably 13. 10 this way and 3 down this way. I think that's the biggest. So this entry would hold 13 for max. That's the maximum amount of money we could get by any possible route at that location. And so it's very easy when you're on the top row or the, the left column because um, you just add up all the numbers to the left, right? So as we travel to the right, uh, we're just going to grab the, the value from the left. Okay. So uh, yeah, 13, all right? 10, 13, yeah. And so the max value here would be 1,010, right? Because the max value by any possible route to get to this spot here, it's highlighted would be this way and then down, okay? And so, uh, so we take the max value of the person to our left and add whatever value is at our location. And we say uh, the direction we came from 
is from the west. And then we'll do the same thing for the left column. So the maximum value here is going to the only there's only one way of getting here. It's from the north, right? So we'll just take the value of the person to our north, which will be four. So the maximum amount of money this guy will have seen as four as it goes down this way. So this guy will be 14. So we will get the value of the person above us plus the value here. And we're going to write down we came here from the north. Okay, and now there's only one other step and we're done. And that's the normal case. So these people in the middle here. And so like for this guy, if you want to figure out for this guy, which way should we come from? We can either come from the north or we can come from the west. And so the max value for this guy is going to be four, five, six, seven, eight. This value will have eight. Or we can check the guy north of us, which will be 12. And so we're like, all right, we will come this way from the north. And so otherwise, um, if the person to our left, if the value of the person to our left is bigger than the value of the person above us, you thought you understood, but now you don't. So do you understand Yoxheimer? Like if we're currently processing this square here, we need to see, should we arrive at this square from the north or from the west? And if there's more money to the north, then we should come from the north. If there's more money to the west, from the west, we should come from the west. You see that? Because there's there, by the time we get here, there, we've already processed all of the maximum routes possible. So at every, every, at every step in the array, we just have to look at the two nearest people. And so this way, the total amount of money to get here, the max possible is five, coming this way, four or five. Or if we came from the west, it would be four. So when we're processing this square, we're gonna say, okay, the guy to the north has more money along that route. So we are gonna come in from the north to this point. So if the person to the left is, has more money than the person north, then the amount of money is from the person to the left plus the money here. And we write down we came in from the west. Um, otherwise, we come in from the north. And that's it. That's, that's the entire um, program. So rather than computing every single possible route, at every point we just look at the amount of money available from the north and the amount of money available from the west. And we say, okay, the total, the max amount of money here is equal to the greater of those two plus whatever amount of money is at this spot. Where does our movement start? It starts here. You start on the top left corner and you can either travel south or east. And so at every point, um, at every point, you can either arrive from the north or you can arrive from the west. And we're basically just saying which one of those two routes has more money along it. And okay, that's the direction we'll come from. And so what we're doing is we're building a table of the max amount of money available at every point. By doing this, we don't have to do a two to the n algorithm, we can do an order n algorithm. And so if we just were to print the max here for Print out the array after we're done.
Yeah, I know. Uh, and so this is, at every point, we now know how much money there is possible to get by the time we get to that point on the map. So, um, then... So So here's the input. So this is how much gold is available at every square. And so for example, for this square, the total maximum amount of money available along that route is 1 because we picked up 1 along the way, right? By the time we get here, the maximum amount of money available by the time we get to that square is four because we picked up one here and three here and here it's ten and here it's a thousand and ten right and then when we process this square well the max amount of money we can get this way is two because we could pick up one here and one here and so when we're processing this square we have to say all right should we come in from the north or should we come in from the west and the answer is the west because there's more money that way and then when we're processing this one we say should we come in from the north there's three gold that way oh but there's two gold that way hmm or sorry, there's four gold. Yeah, there's four gold to the north, and there's two gold to the to the west. So we should come in from the north and pick up the one gold here. So there's five gold. the The max amount of money by the time you get to this point is five, and so you just process that for every point, and you can see there's some good options here in the corners. Right. So by the time we get to the end, though, it's going to be like, yeah, that's that's the best route. So. It's going to output go north, 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 west, 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 west. Okay. And so I, I would, I could write a backtracking thing to print out that route, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I, I think you guys get it now. And so that was a assignment they had a week to do as a senior at CSUMB. And um, they were they were going crazy. He and his partners were like, "Our it's possible," you know. And, it's it's that's not much of a data structure you know but um i thought you guys might be interested in it like you just if you think about things and come up with clever solutions you can this is an order in algorithm instead of order in to the end. <laughs> so um yeah so that's that's it for today guys um Hopefully you learned a little something. Your next homework assignment is going to be called histogram. So let's see, histogram, histogram two, interesting. It's histogram two. Okay. So, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna do a histogram, which is what we did in the first part of the class here. So do what homework? CSI forty one histogram histogram. And what this will do is uh, you'll count how many letters are in a file. That's it. So you got uh, to Monday to do that. It's, it's a pretty easy assignment, I think. So, all right. That's it for today, guys. And I will see you on Friday. All right. Peace out. It'll be due on Monday. It'll be due on Monday. It's, a, it's an easy assignment.